Look at the heaven Works of your fingers are there Moon and stars You set them in place What is a man Do you mind full of him The son of man that you show him grace How majestic is your name in all the earth Oh Lord, our Lord, we praise your name Oh Lord, we praise your name We gaze on your glory Displayed in the heavens above From infant mouth You ordain your praise You gave us rule Over the works of your hand Every creature Kiss your name it all here. Oh Lord, our Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we praise your name. How majestic is your name it all here. Oh Lord, our Lord, we praise your name. Dev's going to come on down. Hey, Coast. Uh, welcome to online church again here at KCC. Uh, good on you. If you're tuning in uh, live or if you're going to catch up on the recording afterwards, it's good to have you here. Hope you're, uh, you're healthy uh, and that you're safe. Uh, I reckon it's good to acknowledge that for, for lots of us there's different emotions kind of going around. Uh, for some there's relief that there's a lockdown that's happened. Others not so much relief, maybe a little bit of agitation. Uh, whatever you're going through at the moment, it's always good to remind ourselves that God is fully in control and He is good. And so can I encourage us as a church uh, a couple of things. One is to pray. Uh, pray for the leaders, pray for the government, uh, for wisdom insight in uh, in what paths decisions uh, are best to do. Uh, pray for us as a church uh, that we would likewise make great uh, decisions and also keep praying for our, uh, our region. Uh, that many people here are facing eternity uh, without Christ and so would you pray. Pray for the lost. Uh, pray that God would use this time to turn people to himself and people would uh, discover the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Uh, secondly, after praying, would you look out for each other? Uh, maybe call people in your coast group, uh, those who are living a, at home alone, give them a, a ring, check up on them, uh, maybe pray with them uh, over the phone, see if they need anything, uh, any of the basics, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, would you, you look out for each other uh, this week? And then thirdly, would you commit to gathering as we're able? Uh, so if your coast group uh, this week is on Zoom, would you jump on? I know there's heaps of people, uh, heaps of us that don't like jumping on uh, Zoom and those kind of things, but uh, would you commit to the people, not necessarily the platform? Jump on, encourage, pray, uh, get into the Word together as, uh, as we kind of navigate our way through this as a faith family. So three things, pray, look out for each other and gather as we're able. With that being said, just a couple of things to update you. Uh, our round table uh, session last night on tech and mental health, unfortunately it was, uh, was cancelled. We'd moved online but still got cancelled. Uh, so if you're waiting in, uh, in the waiting session to get in, uh, it's cancelled. It's off, no need to, uh, to wait any longer. And also next Sunday, uh, 
the dinner with the dead that we've got that's also been cancelled uh, and we'll postpone both of those events uh, to the next few weeks or whenever things look uh, a little bit more stable and uh, also as we continue to get the gospel out there and run the different ministries we'd love you to partner with us financially you can do that online if you're on the coast dc website uh, or you're uh, you're there near it then you can press the give tab and uh, and give online there as you can well folks uh, i'm going to spend some time praying uh, so would you join with me father we thank you uh, we thank you for this this season this moment in time we thank you that you are fully in control and uh, as we may be uh, housebound, uh, we may be locked down, uh, your glory is never locked down. Your majesty and your grace is never locked down. And so Lord, we pray as always for our region. Uh, we ask that you'd show compassion and mercy on those who are facing eternity without you. Uh, use us, uh, even in this time, Lord, use us to share the good news, to share the hope and the joy, the certainty that we have uh, in such a great God. Give us conversations with neighbours or whoever uh, about your goodness. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd be leading us towards people uh, who are searching and who are looking, uh, who are yearning to connect uh, with their Creator. Lord, we also pray for our leaders uh, in the government. Uh, Lord, we ask that you'd help them to uh, make wise choices as they look after the most vulnerable. And uh, Lord, give them wisdom how to navigate this uh, this season as well. Uh, Lord, we also pray for Coast DC, for our Coast Group leaders, for uh, the staff, our admin team, for our youth leaders, our kids leaders, our gappers. Uh, Lord, give them wisdom as they navigate the different ministries that they look after, as they lead their people. Father, we pray uh, that you too would give them the love that they have uh, for the people under their care. Let us as a church uh, operate as a family with you as a foundation. Uh, Lord, let us love each other well during this time as we reach out to those uh, who are doing it tough. Yeah, Lord, we just ask that you would help us uh, to do that well. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, as well as we jump into Romans 11 this afternoon. Uh, Lord, as Chris gets up to preach, uh, we pray that you give him words of clarity. Uh, Lord, we pray that whether we're listening to this live or, or uh, recorded, uh, that your spirit will be doing a wonderful work in our hearts. Uh, open our eyes to your word. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd be giving us uh, the will to obey you, uh, to submit to you and your word, uh, and give us a joy at uh, drinking deeply from the well of your word this afternoon. Lord, we love you heaps and heaps, and we pray these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Well, folks, as I said, we're going to jump into Romans 11. And I'm going to read the whole chapter, and Marty's going to come and read from the CSB version. Hey, family. We join with me as we read God's word together? All of uh, Romans chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Well, don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. And torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they are trying to take my life. But what was God's answer to him? I have left 7,000 for myself who have not bowed down to Baal. In the same way then, there is also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. Now if by grace, then it is not by works. Otherwise grace ceases to be grace. What then? Israel did not find what it was looking for, but the elect did find it. The rest were hardened, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that cannot see, and ears that cannot hear, to this day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent continually. 
I asked then, have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now if their transgression brings riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles insofar as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry if I might somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them. For if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Now if the first fruits are holy, so is the whole batch. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, if some of the branches were broken off, and you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them, and have come to share in the rich root of the cultivated olive tree, do not boast that you are better than those branches. But if you do boast, you do not sustain the root, but the root sustains you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, they were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but beware, because if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Therefore, consider God's kindness and severity, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness towards you, if you remain in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted in, because God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree, against, and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage. But regarding election, they are loved because of the patriarchs, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. As you once dis disobeyed God, but now have received mercy through their disobedience. So they too have now disobeyed, resulting in mercy to you, so that they may also may re receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and how untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Here's Chris. Thanks, Marty. G'day, brothers and sisters. Good to see your faces. Welcome to Lockdown. 2.0 and another year where it feels like absolutely everything gets cancelled. I know for uh, some of you this week, work will have been cancelled in, in some form. School off, uh, events cancelled, like we've heard just uh, from Dev previously. And um, it's not just events and gatherings that gets cancelled uh, in, in these days, is it? It's, it's people too, because we live in a, in a time where we love to cancel uh, other people. So if you, if you say the wrong thing, type the wrong thing, post the wrong thing, you can get you know deplatformed. Your sponsors can be <laughs> can bail on you. You can totally get shut down. And once you, once you get cancelled, it's pretty hard to make a comeback. So we're living in this cancel culture, not just because of COVID, but sometimes um, we also cancel uh, other people ourselves. So I've got a, I've got a good mate, um, and he's basically cancelled his daughter. Um, she has some addictions with uh, alcohol and drugs and was, was uh, caught driving under the influence with her kids uh, in, in the back seat. And my mate, you know, furious with her, and he's basically done with her, and he said, that is it, I'm gonna have nothing to do with her anymore. So um, I don't know if you've ever um, canceled someone in your own life, uh, maybe for having a different opinion to you, something about uh, you know, their attitude toward, toward God or toward government and the lockdowns, toward vaccines, toward uh, gender, um, sexuality, whatever it is. Or maybe you've cancelled someone who's just got a totally uh, different set of morals to you. 
or you would just maybe think they don't have any morals. So you just kind of cancel them from your life. Maybe they've uh, said something about you at work or on social media and you've unfriended them or, or just, you know, refused to speak to them. And, um, you know, it's easy, to, it's easy to write people off and want nothing to do with others. And, and we're looking at Romans 11 today. And one of the big questions that it tackles is, um, is God like that? Like, does God cancel people who reject him forever? Like, specifically, um, has, God, has God written off the Jewish people because most of them have rejected him? You know, they'd, they'd cancelled Jesus. They'd rejected him as, as the Messiah. They'd had him crucified. They actually killed God's only son. They'd rejected the gospel. They're hard-hearted. And God's blessings now seem to be going to the Gentiles as they're coming into the church. And it looks like... Um, it looks like it's game over for Israel. They were God's chosen people, uh, but now they're mainly opposed to Jesus. So does this mean that God has, uh, has cancelled them, withdrawn his blessing from them, and written them off for good? And what I want you to see is you crack open your Bible, follow along with us. I just want you to see the big picture answer here. It's a very detailed chapter. We won't be able to get into all the detail, but the big picture, the big picture answer, have a look there at verses 1 and verses 11. You'll see the question and the answer. Verse 1 says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. Verse 11, he says, I ask then, have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not. Right, so the big, the big point to get out of this chapter is that even though people reject God, it doesn't mean that God rejects them forever. And this is something I reckon we, we all have to wrestle with because we all know people who've rejected God and it is tempting for us to assume that our God has written them off or that they're somehow beyond his grace. You know, like that person, they're like way too hard-hearted. They're never going to become a Christian. But there's no way that person would ever come to our church or become a Christian. There's no way that person who used to come to church would ever come back. And so I've got, uh, you know, some schoolmates that um, I prayed for a lot in my younger days. You know, my friend Simon, Susanna, Prayed for them a lot, spent a lot of time uh, agonising uh, over them, um, trying to invite them, talk to them. They never really showed uh, a whole lot of interest. And if I'm honest, I've, I've pretty much quit um, praying for them. Or my, um, my church mates, some of my church mates who used, to, who used to be in fellowship with us, used to lead ministries with us, who've, uh, who've bailed. And I used to pray for them. And uh, to be honest, for some of them, I've, I've quit. Because I just, I just wonder if, you know, how likely it is, is it that they'd ever really come back. And I think that's the temptation for us. We, we can put people in this, um, like they're, they're too hard toward God basket. And so we write them off and think there's, there's no point praying for them. There's no point inviting them anymore. There's no point trying to share the gospel with them. And so maybe you've got a family member in that category for you or a good friend. Maybe your wife or your husband um, maybe in the, in the past you've, you've prayed for them, shared with them, tried to invite them, talk to them. But more recently, that's just fallen off the radar because maybe if not in your head, but in your heart, you've kind of just thought, no, nah, it's not going to happen. Maybe someone you know who used to follow Christ, someone who used to go to youth group with you when you are a kid, maybe one of your youth leaders or a pastor, maybe an author, a Christian author who was influential on you, some scholar, but now they've kind of bailed on Jesus and you just think, nah, too far gone. Let me ask this question. Now, like, do you really think people are beyond God's grace? I know many of you out there will go, of course they're not. Of course they're not. But, but if you don't think they're beyond God's grace, do you still pray for them? Do you still seek to speak to them or invite them? Or really, in practice, have you written them off and stuck them in the too hard basket? So the big point today to take away is this, that it, even though people reject God, right, it doesn't mean that God has rejected them forever. So we shouldn't write them off either. We should keep praying, keep inviting, keep pointing them to Christ because God's grace is big enough for everyone. And I reckon that's sweet news. So let's dig in. Verse 1, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. And then that Paul gives three examples why this, isn't the, ca why this is uh, the case, that he hasn't quit on all the Israelites. He says, um, uh, For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Paul's saying, well, of course God hasn't ditched all the Israelites. I'm one of them. I'm one of them, and, and God saved me. And if you know the backstory of Paul, you'll know that is an amazing display of God's grace. 
Because what was he like before he came to Christ? He was, he was um, a hater of Christ, a persecutor of God's people, a murderer. Yet God didn't write him off. God grabbed hold of him, made him his own person. And Paul is sweet evidence that God doesn't write people off forever, no matter how hard they are. And then he goes on to give two other examples. That the first one is about the time of the, of the prophet Elijah from verse 2. He says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. But don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left and they're trying to take my life. But what was God's answer to him? I have left 7,000 for myself who have not bowed down to Baal. Right, so he's talking about an example from the Old Testament, 1 Kings 19. Elijah thinks he's the only one left. I'm the only true believer left. And God says, no, you're not. There's 7,000 others who have remained faithful to me. There's a remnant. God, God doesn't ditch his people when they're unfaithful to him. And then he looks around and he says, there's others today too. So verse 5, in the same way, then, there is also at the present time a remnant chosen by grace. Now, if by grace then it is not by works, otherwise grace ceases to be grace. What then? Israel did not find what it was looking for, but the elect did find it. So even though most of the Jews had rejected Jesus as as Messiah, there was a remnant, a remaining bunch who'd responded to Jesus as Messiah. And they didn't do that because they were somehow smarter than the other Jews or better than the other Jews. We're told it's only because of God's grace. God had graciously chosen them to be his. They are his elect, the ones he'd chosen to save by his grace. But the rest, the majority, they had hard hearts toward God that rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And as a result, part of God's judgment on them was a hardening of their hearts. So pick it up in verse 7, the second half there. The rest, they were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear to this day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent continually. Right, So he quotes a few Old Testament verses here to make the point that part of God's judgment on them is that he hardens their hearts. Now that sounds uh, pretty harsh, doesn't it? God hardening someone's heart. We've seen this come up a few times already in the book of Romans, chapter 1. God gave people over to their sins. It's like they said, we don't want you, God. We want to do our own thing. And he says, okay, part of my judgment is go for it. Do whatever you want. Leave me out of it. You can't have me. And we also see back in chapter 9, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And it's important, all these, uh, all these verses talking about God hardening hearts, the context these, of these Old Testament quotes, they're not about uh, people who desperately were loving God, desperately wanting God, desperately keen to worship him and respond well to him. They're all about people who are actively rebelling and rejecting God, and he confirms them in their rejection. And so this leads to the next question. Well, if God has confirmed them in their rejection, does that mean that he's written the rest of Israel off forever? And again, the answer is no, right? Verse 11, no. God is actually using their current rejection to work out his own purposes to one day bring many of them back in. So I'll pick it up in verse 11. I ask then, have they stumbled so as to fall? Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if their transgression brings riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Insofar as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if I might somehow make my own people jealous to save some of them. For if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Right, so there's two big things to notice here. The first one is that Israel's sin means blessing for the Gentiles. And you'll see it there halfway through verse 11. We're told, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. In verse 12, it says, their transgression brings riches for the world. And in verse 15, it says, their rejection brings reconciliation to the world. You think, how does that work? Like, how does Israel's sin 
result in the world getting richly blessed, the Gentiles getting saved and reconciled to God? Well, think about, think about the nature of their transgression. Two big parts to it. The first one is that they rejected Jesus as the Messiah and ended up having him crucified. And it was on the cross that Jesus actually died for the sins of all nations. So Gentiles too could have their sins forgiven. And secondly, they rejected the gospel. Uh, when the missionaries, the first missionaries came and preached to them, many of the Jews uh, rejected the message. And so the missionaries then turned their attention to the Gentiles. And this was part of the strategy Jesus gave to his disciples. He said, basically, go into, go into new towns. But the gospel is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So when Paul and the other apostles and church planters went to different towns, they'd start at the synagogue, start with the Jews, start trying to persuade them from the scriptures that Jesus is Messiah. Some would believe, most would reject, then they'd turn their attention to the Gentiles in the neighborhood. So, so the sin of the, of the Israelites actually means blessing for the Gentiles. So that's part of God's purpose in Israel's rejection, is actually to bless the Gentiles. That's everyone who's not a Jew, Aussies like us. Second thing to notice from these, these verses is that God's purpose in blessing the Gentiles was actually to make the Jews jealous. Did you see that there in verse 11? <clears throat> it says, I ask then... Have they stumbled as to fall? Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. You see it again in verse 13. He says, Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Insofar as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry if I might somehow make my own people jealous to save some of them. Now, uh, one, of my, one of my daughters in primary school the other day, the teacher said, uh, we're going to do some bush dancing today. And my daughter told me that the, uh, there was one particular boy in the class who's like, nah, no way, not doing it, hate this, don't want to do bush dancing. And, uh, and the teacher said, okay then, it's all right, you can sit out. So the kid had to sit out. And then, uh, then the kid saw all the other kids having an awesome time doing bush dancing, and who wouldn't have an awesome time doing bush dancing? And then the kid says to the teacher, can I, can I join in? And the teacher actually said, no, you can't, you can't. There's no one who needs a partner, so you'll have to sit out. But he got jealous when he saw the action and he wanted in. And that's part of actually God's plans and purposes for the Jewish people. They'd see the Gentiles bush dancing, you know, enjoying the blessings of the gospel. They have a peace with God that comes not from works but by grace. They have a relationship with God that's not about bowing down to idols and serving them. They've received forgiveness and so they know a deep peace a joy, they have um, a, a real hope in the face of death, knowing that Christ has conquered that. And the Gentiles, as they live out their new lives in Christ, and, uh, and, the, and the Jews observe this, they observe the love they have for one another, the, the graciousness, their generosity, the humility, the forgiveness they offer, they're meant to get jealous, to see that action and want in. That's part of God's strategy. Now, would you come up with a plan like that to make people jealous I mean, as a church, we've had plenty of dream and scheme sessions, plenty of chance for people to make their suggestions for how we can best make people in our region aware of the gospel and meet Jesus. And not once in 13 years has anyone said, let's work hard at making them jealous. Not once. At our staff planning meetings, not once has this come up as a strategy. But here we go. This is the Lord's strategy. And it actually works sometimes here in Australia too, amongst the Gentiles. And people see something different in Christians or in Christian community makes them interested, makes them actually jealous. They see that we got something they don't and they want in. They see something about the depth of community we have, the welcoming nature of our community. And we know Jesus said they're going to know, that they'll know you're my disciples by your love. They'll see the way we do marriage and hopefully they'll see that it's, it's shaped by the gospel, that husbands lay their lives down for their wives. And their wives love and honour their husbands like the church uh, honours Jesus. And our marriages should shine, make them jealous. Our joy should make people jealous. And we've been forgiven. We have a peace with God. That, that should lead to a confidence and, and, a, and a sure hope that others do not have. And the gracious way that we live. Man, we're allowed to be generous. We should be generous to others because we've received such generosity to God. And so don't underestimate. Um, the drawing power of a life well lived to soften a hard heart because our lifestyles are meant to make people jealous and to want Jesus 
Well, Paul goes on to use this, uh, this metaphor of an olive tree um, to explain more of God's purposes in, uh, in saving many of the Jewish people and to remind Gentiles like us Aussies to stay humble and to not think we're better than the Jews. So we'll pick it up in verse uh, 16. It says, Now if the first fruits are holy, so is the whole batch. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now if some of the branches were broken off, and you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them, and have come to share in the rich root of the cultivated olive tree, do not boast that you are better than those branches. But if you do boast, you do not sustain the root but the root sustains you. Then you'll say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, they were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith. <clears throat> All right, so the metaphor here is olive tree. The olive tree represents God's people. In the Old Testament, the olive tree was a symbol of, of the nation of Israel. The root of the tree is like the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the promises God made to them. The first bunch of branches are the Jewish people, um, the Israelites, God's chosen people. Some of those branches have been broken off, and these represent the, the unbelieving Jews, the majority of Jews in Paul's day. But some are wild branches that have been grafted in, and that's the Gentiles who've trusted in Jesus as Messiah, and they now share in the root the blessings, the promises made to the Jewish people. So what's that all mean? What's that all about? Well, uh, the guts of it is in verse 18, his main point there. It's so that he says, you do not boast that you're better than those branches. Now, the big point is don't think that you're, you're better than them because God has somehow ditched them and now picked you. That doesn't mean you're better. God didn't save you because you're somehow smarter, better, more deserving than the Jews who rejected him. In fact, it's, it's pretty uh, humbling. He says, like, you're like the weed, the wild one been graciously grafted in into their thing like you are the ring in here now i remember the first time that i ever got uh, you know invited to speak at, a, at another church's weekend away and uh i felt quite honored to be asked and i uh, felt pretty good about it and, and i said yes and uh and then the person on the phone said oh what a relief like our speaker pulled out, I've called five other guys, none, they all said no, and finally I found someone who can do it. And I'm like, it's pretty hard to, uh, pretty hard to boast when that, <laughs> that's kind of the reality. Like when you're the ring in, you're the latecomer, just a weed grafted in, nothing to boast about. And that's what it is like for us Gentiles as we get grafted in just by God's grace. Not because we're better but just because our God has been gracious to us. And, he, and he's totally able to show the same kindness to the Jews that he's, he's shown to us. And, um, and there's a warning for us here in that too, because, you know, the whole thing can be flipped. Verse 20, he says, True enough, they were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but beware, because if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Therefore, Consider God's kindness and severity. Severity toward those who've fallen, but kindness, but God's kindness toward you, if you remain in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, they will be grafted in, because God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree, and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted in, be grafted into their own olive tree? So he's saying, beware, guys. If if the cut the cutting off happened to them, just be careful it doesn't happen to you. And what you ought to do is to consider God's kindness and severity. Right? He was kind when he grafted the Gentiles in. He was severe when he cut the unbelieving Jews off and hardened their hearts. But his kindness can also graft the, the Jews back in if they put their trust in Christ. And his severity can also cut you off if you stop trusting Christ. So the point here is you don't be arrogant. Don't think you're better than others. Don't think that you're somehow worthy because of your own good works. And remain in his kindness. That is continue in the grace of God. Continue to put your trust in Jesus alone, in God's grace and his mercy alone. That's how you stay plugged in. So as we kind of think about how some of this applies, do, when, you, when you really think about it, do you think that you are better than others spiritually? Are there, are there sometimes you just think of people, how don't they get it? 
it's so obvious especially toward other Jewish people they had thousands of years had the scriptures all pointing forward to Christ the promises he's come in fulfillment of them you'd think of all people they should get it do you ever think man what is wrong with them and it's easy to think you, you might have you might have got it if you were there but just beware of, of kind of mentally patting yourself on the back for believing the gospel and thinking that somehow that makes you smarter or better than those who haven't come to Christ yet. And beware of subtly looking down on others who haven't uh, responded to Christ yet or writing them off totally. And obviously um, there's no place at all for racism in God's church, no place at all for anti-Semitism, being anti-Jewish. God is still loving toward his chosen people the jews he hasn't written them off he's not finished with israel in fact uh, god is going to do a new work in the future to bring many to himself look at verse 25 he says i don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery brothers and sisters so that you will not be conceited a partial hardening has come upon israel until the fullness of the gentiles has come in and in this way all israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage, but regarding election, they are loved because of the patriarchs, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. As you once disobeyed God and now have received mercy through their disobedience, so they too have now disobeyed, resulting in mercy to you, so that they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may have mercy on all. Guys, this is, this is massive. We're actually being let in on a mystery here that God is revealing to us in Scripture. And the mystery's got four parts. Right At the time that Paul is writing, the majority of Israel has had their hearts hardened. At the same time, number two, lots of Gentiles are coming to salvation. Number three, in the future, God's going to do a big work amongst the Jews where all Israel will be saved, verse 26. And at the end of the day, both Jews and Gentiles were all saved only by God's mercy and grace. So God hasn't written off his people Israel. Verse 26, remember, all Israel will be saved. Now, this doesn't mean that every single person who has you know, some kind of physical descent from, from Abraham and the patriarchs is going to be saved. All Israel doesn't mean every single Jewish person. If you flick back in your Bible to chapter 9, verse 6, you remember it said, All Israel, sorry, not all Israel are Israel. That is, not, not everyone with Jewish blood is truly spiritual Israel. God never promised to save every single descendant of Abraham. He didn't predestine every physical descendant of Abraham to be saved. But God will be faithful to his promises. And one day, heaps, heaps of them are going to turn to Christ. What a day that's going to be. It's going to be beautiful. God's going to soften many of their hardened hearts. He will save all of his elect from among Israel. And they're going to be grafted back into the olive tree alongside all the believing Gentiles. How's that going to happen? How's he going to save them? Well, we're told they'll put their trust in the Deliverer. That is, they'll recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the one who came to deliver them from their sin by dying on the cross for them, and they'll come to him for mercy, just like we did, and they'll be saved by his grace alone. And all this is going to prove, once again, that God is always faithful to his promises, his purposes are always are going to happen. He's sovereign in salvation. He chooses who he'll save. He's mapped out how he'll save them. He's got his own plan for how to bring that about. He even knows when he'll save them. And he's going to use the sin of Israel to bring blessing to the Gentiles. And then he'll use the joy-filled lives of the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous and point them to Jesus. Right? So the main point... Let's wrap this up. The main point is that even though, even though people reject God, it doesn't mean that God rejects them forever. And so we shouldn't write people off either. We should keep praying, keep inviting, keep sharing, keep investing in gospel ministries because no one is too far gone for God to save by his grace, whether they are a Jew or a Gentile. This should lead to some humility for us. We are not better than anyone else. We are only saved by God's grace to us. We are no better than the person we know who is, has the most hard heart to God.
this should also give us perseverance. Guys, God is able to save the hardest heart. When I was in my 20s, uh, all my grandparents had passed away. And so I asked this granny at the church I was going to if she'd be my, my grandma. And she was gold, super loving, mega kind, and, and uh, she was a widow. And God had saved her when she was uh, older, like 40 years old. She became a Christian. And her husband, uh, Ron, wasn't a believer. And he was pretty hard to the gospel. And she prayed for him for 40 years. And then two years before he passed away, uh, Ron uh, gave his life to Christ, received mercy, and, uh, <laughs> and was saved. And it was so cool every time she would speak of, uh, of Ron, she'd say, oh, she'd call him My Ron. My Ron, he was hard, but the Lord got hold of him. And my Ron now, he's with the Lord. And that's always encouraged me to persevere in, in prayer for hard hearts. Now, there's another fella at, at our church. And, um, you know, sometimes we'll ring up people from church and say, you know, how you going? What can we pray for? Now he basically just says, you know, you know what to pray for. And because every time I've ever asked him, his prayer request has always been the same. Please pray for my wife and my boys to become Christians. That's it. And, and that's been going on for years. My guess is he's going to persevere in that. Good on you, mate. You know who you are. Press on. So, brothers and sisters, as we wrap up, let's not give up on people. Let's not cancel them, write them off, because God's grace is big enough for anyone. Do you believe that? Do you believe that if he wanted to, God could save the person you would vote most unlikely to ever become a Christian? Do you believe that God could save every single high school student at the Foster campus? Do you believe that God might have 7,000 others of his people in this town that he wants to bring to himself? He may have. The hardest heart will not be able to stop his unstoppable grace to them. So don't quit. Don't write people off. Keep praying. Keep inviting. Keep speaking keep investing in gospel ministries and keep seeking to live a life that will make those around us jealous as they see how good it is to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us, guys. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who's been his counsellor? And who's ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to all things, to him be the glory. Father, we want to praise you for your magnificent and strange plan to draw all people to yourself through Christ, both Jews and Gentiles. Thank you that in your mercy you've grafted many of us in. I want to pray right now for those who've quit praying, inviting, sharing, that you'd rekindle a love for the lost in them and help them to persevere, knowing that you can break the hardest heart, you can soften the hardest heart, and you can save whoever you want. We pray there'd be many in this town that you would call to yourself. Please use us as part of your plans. We also pray for the Israelites, many Jewish people around the globe, some scattered, many in Israel. We pray that you'll do a mighty work among them, even in our generation where many of them would come to see Jesus as their Messiah. I pray for Christians who know Jewish people, that they do a great job showing them how good Jesus is. God, I pray you'll help us to stay humble and to persevere so that more people come to know Jesus and so that you get more glory for yourself. Amen. All right, catch you around, guys. I'm going to hand over to Marty. Father, you work through your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. Father, you love 
be still And in love before you laid the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible call When Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone But nothing I did could ever atone When Jesus, you paid my debt By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation I am born again by grace and grace alone I was in darkness, so loved my life I never knew the day from the night the Spirit, you made me see I swore I knew the way on my own Head full of rocks, a heart made of stone The Spirit, you moved in me And at your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven said it's in by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Family, that's it for our service uh, this afternoon. And uh, Marty assures me that this video is going to stay on Facebook, on our Facebook page for a little bit longer. And then it's going to cross over to our YouTube page. So subscribe to that uh, if you want to share it or direct other people to it. And then uh, just later this week, it'll get uploaded to our Coast DC website. Well, folks, I've been encouraged. Uh, a couple of things I pulled out uh, for me is... How can I make people jealous uh, for Jesus this week? In lockdown, in what we're going through, uh, how can I have joy and hope and assurance in what's happening and uh, the way that I live for Jesus? Uh, how can I make people jealous for Him? Uh, secondly, don't quit on hard hearts. Uh, whoever's there in your life who seems hard against the gospel, keep praying, keep inviting, keep sharing. Uh, don't give up on them because God hasn't. And lastly, uh, let's all look forward to a time when we can all bush dance again. There'll be much joy in the land, a lot of heel-toe, heel-toe and sliding going on. Look forward to that because good times are coming. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know what's going to happen uh, with all this kind of stuff as the week progresses, whether we're online, that kind of stuff. Uh, other than that, we love your faces and let the weird times keep on rolling. See ya. <laughs>